The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning and thank you for joining us for our next webinar related to our Municipal Concrete Paving webinar series. We are now in the case study portion to showcase that municipalities are using concrete and that, that it is a long-term solution. Uh, today's presentation will feature a unique approach of resurfacing an existing road without having to completely reconstruct it from the base up. So more specifically, we will be looking at the unbonded concrete overlay that was used on Jamestown Avenue in Ham Hamilton back in 2016. This pilot project had input from numerous industry experts, including Concrete Ontario, the Cement Association of Canada, and the Center for Pavement and Transportation Technology from the University of Waterloo. Now, in, in addition to this project, an overview will also be provided on new concrete paving projects that Hamilton has recently completed. But before we do get to uh, the presentation and the presenter, uh, just some housekeeping items. Uh, my name is Alan Carey and I'm the Director of Technical Services at Concrete Ontario and I will be your mm -hmm. facilitator. And in addition to myself, we again have uh, Tim Smith from the Cement Association. So good morning, Tim. Good morning. Now you were with Lafarge, I believe, uh, when this project uh, was built um, and since you've transferred to Englobe and the Cement Association of Canada, so you'll have a pretty good insight of the overall project. Yeah, yeah, I was working with Lafarge at the time. Perfect. Um, now, just to continue on housekeeping, uh, this will be approximately a 45-minute webinar with questions and answers at the end. All participants are muted and will remain that way for the entire webinar. If you do have a question, please use the GoToWebinar questions pane on the right side of your screen and type in your questions. Um, again, all questions will be uh, addressed at the end. The webinar is currently being recorded and uh, will be posted on the Concrete Ontario website along with a PDF copy of the presentation. Now, if you missed any of our previous webinars, they are all available on the Concrete Ontario website under publications and webinar presentations. You can look at the, the PDF copies of the presentations or you can listen to the recording, uh, which is on YouTube. Now, in terms of your uh, presenter, uh, today's presenter is Michael Beck from the city of Hamilton. Um, Michael is the uh, senior project design uh, manager for this, the design section of um, Public Works. Um, so good morning, Mike, how are you? Good morning, Alan, thank you very much. Glad to be here. Now you've spent a lot of time on this project and obviously you have a lot of experience when it comes to concrete pavements in the last few years. Um, is there anything specific about this project that you wanna highlight just in terms of before we start the presentation? Um, this, this this project actually was scheduled to be an asphalt uh, shave and pave basically. And we, you know, we wanted to try some new approaches to uh, doing um, resurfacing in our local roads. And uh, we actually, you'll see in the end, there's, there's some surprises with cost savings that we actually found uh, from the life cycle analysis. And as well, it's it's held up quite well considering um, the uh, the time that's had and and what was done. So we're very happy with the the project so far. Great. And just to give you a little bit more background about Mike, uh, Mike is a professional engineer that works as a senior project manager in the Public Works Department at the City of Hamilton. He's a graduate from Conestoga College and McMaster University, where he studied civil engineering. Uh, Mike's career started in consulting, where he worked on both public and private sector projects that range from working in the field to collecting geotechnical samples, concrete and asphalt testing, to design projects that range from small retaining walls all the way up to provincial and municipal infrastructure projects. In the fall of 2004, Mike joined the city of Hamilton's development department and eventually made it over to Public Works, where he joined the engineering services section in 2009. Mike's experience with the city has been on a variety of projects that has included simple shaven paves, to reconstructs including underground utilities, structures, and new or greenfield projects. Uh, Mike currently sits um, on the MEA board, sorry, not board, uh, sits on MEA as a member, and uh, he's also a member of the OPS Specialty Committee on Pavements. So again, thank you very much, Mike, for helping us out this morning, and uh, I'll turn over the presentation uh, to you now so you can start us off. Great, thanks, Alan. So before we start, I just wanted to um, also recognize um, this, this project was done with the CPAT uh, through the University of Waterloo, the Center of Pavement and Transportation Technology. So I'd like to thank uh, Raha Wafa 
that um, worked on it. This was her master's thesis that she, she did on the unbonded overlays, as well as Susan Tai, who was instrumental in getting this project through. So we'll get started here. So just a little update on or brief explanation on the city of Hamilton. The city of Hamilton, the metro area of the city of Hamilton, so it includes all the boroughs, Waterdown, Ancaster, Dundas, Stony Creek, uh, has a pop total population of about 767,000 people. That's as of 2020. And uh, it covers approximately um, 1,117 square kilometers. This city maintains right now currently 64, 190 lane kilometers of roadway and of that there is 5,646 lanes kilometers of asphalt on granular roads. The city has 822 lane kilometers of composite roads which is asphalt on concrete road base and we have about 22 lanes now of exposed concrete roads. Over the next 10 years uh, the city's earmarked about 300 million dollars in funding for road resurfacing. Now that obviously will depend on budgets and all that, but that's that's what the um, the forecast is for the next ten years and projects that are going to be going out. So typical road resurfacing rehabilitation in the city of Hamilton. Uh, typically, it's a it's a shave and pave operation here at the city, uh, and that includes composite pavements where we take the asphalt down to the to the concrete base. Um, and th and that's pretty much the staple of what the city does for resurfacing contracts. Went too far, sorry. It's a delay in the clicking. So what are the pros and cons of asphalt resurfacing? Well, the pros are basically the minimal impact to the public. Um, a shave and pave allows us to get in and out rather quickly um, with the minimal impact to the residents or businesses. It's relatively cost effective. Um, it gives you a quiet and smooth ride on the asphalt once it's paved. It does increase the IRI, uh, as well as pavement markings are, are reflective uh, much better when you're driving on brand new asphalt. What are the cons of a shave and pave though? In normal asphalt shave and paves, the cons are, you know, if you're for every inch of asphalt that you place, um, you can expect reflective cracking of the underlying cracks to happen within a year. So a year to two years, I should say. Um, the other problem is on composite roads, you need to seal the joints. And sometimes that's really impractical depending upon the, the concrete base. Um, asphalt tends to have a shorter lifespan because of cracking. If, if you're not maintaining that asphalt on a regular basis, it will crack uh, quite quickly. And, and you know, once that freeze thaw action and water starts to migrate in through those cracks, um, the asphalt can deteriorate quite quickly. The issue is also with the similar metal materials on a uh, composite road where you have an asphalt bonded to a, a concrete and sometimes if that layer doesn't bond now you have the two pavements acting separately and, and that doesn't in, uh, do much for the strength of that road. As well as uh, asphalt really holds that heat and anybody that lives in a city atmosphere can attest to how hot it is in the summer, um, especially with all that pavement just for radiating that heat back up to you. So this is what a typical <clears throat> road resurfacing project looks like in, this, in the city. Um, you mill it and then you fill it. In the top left corner you can see actually one of the uh, composite roads where the uh, concrete is or exposed because the asphalt is uh, spalled away from the concrete. Probably wasn't a very good bond, may not have been um, any tack coat used or or just uh, water has gotten in underneath and, and caused it to pop off. So in 2016, the city partnered with CPAT uh, to develop a proposal to design a, a pilot project involving concrete, um, doing an overlay on a composite pavement uh, in the residential streets in the city. And what the city wanted was basically a, um, a different approach to rehabilitating composite roads. We wanted to see if an overlay uh, could generally extend the existing pavement service life while requiring minimal maintenance. The, the intent was that if we put a concrete overlay in, could we um, get a better product and not have to come back and crack seal or, or do a seal of some sort on it or, or do a shave and pave um, 
you know, in 15 years. So we're hoping that the concrete overlay could, could last longer. So there's some pros and cons, obviously. The, the pros would be, we, we would hope that it'd be durable, longer lifespan, um, lower maintenance costs because we shouldn't have to go back to do any uh, short-term maintenance, five, 10, 15 years. Um, the overall life cycle cost analysis should be generally less if we don't have to do much maintenance. The concrete overlays, because you have the exposed concrete surface, would uh, allow it to reflect heat better. And it should be more environmentally friendly um, in the long run when you consider um, you know, the process that's involved in the asphalt production and, and the bitumens being removed from the soil. Um, compared to concrete, it should be relatively less. Um, not saying the concrete is perfect, but, but it, it's relatively less when compared to asphalt. The cons is there is some initial costs. Um, you know, concrete is, is laborious being placed uh, and, and the material itself is a little bit more expensive. But again, I think you'll see the, the outcome of that in the uh, life cycle analysis. Um, joints and cracks, they're hard to mitigate when if you don't, if you have a lot of cracking underneath, with the, especially with a bonded concrete. Uh, one of the concerns also from a municipal point of view is access to the city residents. So the, we want to allow the, the residents to be able to access their properties um, with minimal disruption. I mean, during construction, it's impossible to do that. Um, but we want to be able to make sure they can walk to their sidewalks or they can you know, get their groceries. And, and if obviously, if, if someone has a disability and requires assistance, how, how we can allow them to get in and out of their house. Um, and finally, pavement markings is always a question, you know, with concrete roads, exposed concrete roads specifically, um, you know, will the white lines of the uh, pavement markings show up and reflect and, and how will they perform in the long run? So what is an overlay? So concrete overlays, we've got, uh, in this case, we looked at three different types of this project. We looked at bonded overlay, which is basically where you have a, a concrete, existing concrete structure sitting on top of its granular base, and then you bond that concrete overlay to it um, to, to basically create a thicker slab of concrete. The, the intent is that overlay would bond uh, with the existing concrete that it becomes basically one pavement. The other option would be an unbonded overlay, in this case, asphalt. So in this case, you have the existing concrete base and or a concrete, exposed concrete structure. Um, and what you do is you place a thin lift of asphalt uh, on top of it. Um, and then the new concrete overlay would go on top. So you're increasing the thickness of the overall um, pavement structure, but the intent of that unbonded lay is to decouple the, the two surfaces of the concrete so that uh, reflective cracking can be mitigated, um, movement of the slabs can be mitigated, and that surface layer of concrete um, then becomes um, less susceptible to, to cracking and, and damage. The other option we looked at, which was a unique option, was to do a unbonded overlay, but using a geotextile. And, and one of the purposes for looking at this was when you look at the unbonded overlay with asphalt, you're, you're already increasing that asphalt thickness, or sorry, the, the pavement structure thickness. Um, I'll explain a little bit more when we get into the, showing some of the cores, but uh, in a residential roadway, when you're doing a resurfacing, we don't want to um, change the elevation of the curbs or sidewalk as there's you know, impacts that you know, continue domino effect down with the, uh, replacement of driveways or how do you have the driveways tie in and sidewalks and all that sort of thing. So an unbonded overlay with a geotextile separating those two layers was looked at um, as, a, as a possibility that you could decouple the two uh, layers of concrete, the existing concrete surface and the uh, new concrete overlay with that geotextile layer allowing it to move uh, between each other. So when we sat down with CPAT and, and discussed, we wanted to look at uh, a location selection. What, what's a good road? We, we wanted to make sure that this was not gonna pick a road that was um, going to fail, but also picked a road that was typical for something within the city. So 
what we were looking for was a composite road. We had something that had a good concrete base, um, a project that was already up for rehabilitation or resurfacing, an area that had uh, either minimum amount of residential uh, properties facing the roadway, um, or an area that we know that we could allow um, residents access to their properties with minimal um, disruption, uh, as well as um, pedestrian safety was important too. So we want to make sure that this could be done while it, people were able to walk to work, school, catch the bus, those sorts of things. But the other key one, which is really important to the city was we want to pick a project that the underground infrastructure was in good condition. We did, I didn't want to um, come back to this project in five years and have to rip up a bunch of panels because we had a, a, a service that failed or a water main that um, decided to pop during the winter. So that was very important in the selection process. So the city had a project called the Yeovil Neighborhood. Uh, it was up for resurfacing, scheduled in 2017. Uh, there's three roads <clears throat> as part of this neighborhood that fit the requirements for a trial. Um, the three roads were Jamestown Avenue, Hawk Ridge, and Caledon. Uh, Hawk Ridge and Caledon are north-south running roads, and Jamestown is a uh, east-west road that connects West 5th to Upper James, if you know Hamilton. Jamestown Avenue was selected. It was a good candidate. Um, I'll get into explanation why. Uh, it was constructed in the 60s. Uh, it was phased construction, 1964 to 1968. It had a good concrete structure, so the underlying concrete road base was between 160 millimeters and 220 millimeters. Um, the nice thing was Hawkridge and Caledon broke up Jamestown Avenue to in three almost evenly, uh, perfectly evenly sections, uh, which made a great candidate for doing trials of different types in, in, on one section of roadway where it's going to get the same type of uh, traffic loadings. Uh, it had access to the residents during construction, so the side streets were open for parking, so the residents uh, were not um, landlocked in while the construction of the concrete road was, was being done. Uh, the geometry of the street is quite straight. Um, it, there's a, a slight vertical curve in the middle, so there's a little bit of a sag, but uh, for, in general, it's, it's straight. And the, under, oops, and the underground utilities were um, in uh, good shape. So just zooming in here, um, that's the Yeovil neighborhood. The, um, oh, it's, something's going on here. It's just, uh, Okay, let's try this again. So we'll try this again. This is the zoom in on um, Hamilton where we're at. It's the Oville neighborhood, we're zooming in. Jamestown, like I was saying, is the east-west uh, road. West 5th is to the west of the project. Upper James is to the east of the project and it goes Hawk Ridge and Caledon running north-south. This is the uh, original construction or the uh, design drawings for Jamestown. Uh, shows the underground servicing in the area. And this is the pre-existing conditions of the of Jamestown Avenue when we got out there for the selection. So the roadway is um, just a couple things of note. The existing sidewalks were uh, in the and two of the sections were original. Um, you can see that we have their, what we call a standard apron approach there, the, where the apron actually juts out into the roadway by about nine inches. That's to help the cars enter their driveway without bottoming out, but also provide a flat surface for walking on at the uh, backside of the sidewalk. Um, from a design point of view, you know, when we're walking our roads in Hamilton, we look for the gutter bricks. That's a key indicator that uh, if the gutter bricks are there, that the road is a composite road. Sometimes you can see cracking on a, on a road that maybe was overlaid with asphalt, and you can see that crack along the gutter line. Um, those gutter bricks are typically removed now during our road resurfacing contracts, or they're infilled with concrete and, and then paved over top. Just another shot of the center line looking um, west from uh, Caledon up towards West 5th. Again, some failure going on. 
And along the south curb, again, looking at the uh, gutter bricks, you can see that there's been some pavement repairs up near the manhole structure there. So pre-construction condition. So the original city scope of work for Jameson was to complete the following. We were gonna strip the asphalt to concrete base, repair the concrete curbs and sidewalks and approaches. We were just gonna do spot repairs uh, to keep the costs down. And then we we're gonna put an 80 mil overlay of asphalt. Uh, talking to CPAT team, the Cement Association in, in Concrete Canada, or sorry, Concrete Ontario, um, we developed an investigation and in how to work to best determine the type of overlay to move forward with. And as part of that, the CPAT team created a general plan. Basically the general plan was remove the asphalt, assess the existing condition of the concrete. Through that assessment, determine whether or not we should go with a bonded or an unbonded overlay. Do some pre-overlay treatments and repairs. So any of the really, really bad sections of concrete base would be removed and repaired. And then depending upon what the decision was, bonded, we would scarify the existing surface and, and pave the bonded overlay. If we went unbonded, then we would either use the asphalt or the geotextile segregation layer, separation layer and provide the pave the bonded overlay. So for the overlay construction, um, the existing pavement must first visually be uh, reviewed and inspected. Non-destructive testing is typically done and should be done to determine the condition of the underlying pavement layers. So to try and see if we can figure out from just the, the surface asphalt, if we can determine what type of failure is occurring or if there's failure going on in the uh, concrete road structure, the, the base beneath. Once that's inspected, the asphalt layer gets milled off. So we're working from the bottom up. Uh, the asphalt layer gets milled off, exposes the uh, existing concrete base. And you know we look for cracking, uh, see if there's patches that's required. Um, and then to determine how bad the concrete road base is. And then once that's done, we uh, do the paving of the bonded or unbonded overlay. It's, generally how the, the process went. So prior to determining the overlay, the, as I said, the concrete base gets assessed. And part of that CPAT, uh, Raha, what they did was they did the following uh, testing. So the city actually did coring. We do coring for the majority of our resurfacing projects. Uh, we send a consultant out to core the road and give us an idea of what the existing road structure is, including um, underneath the granulars, if they can determine the material or the existing soil underneath the granular, beneath the road structure. Um, then they, we, we completed some falling weight deflectometer testing, which was followed up in the end with um, testing after the overlay was placed. Lightweight deflectometer, which is more of a handheld, the, the falling weight deflectometer testing is done with a typically pulled behind a truck and um, it's a much larger uh, trailer that allows the heavier loads to be um, transmitted for the test. The lightweight is more of a handheld one that is uh, moved from station to station um, and just dropped by hand. And then um, we removed the existing asphalt surface, as I said, we shaved it off and did a visual assessment and looked to see how bad the um, cracking is or deterioration of the asphalt or the concrete. Um, once all that is done, they, we also looked at, um, uh, sorry, the SERPRO, we, we also did a, um, surface, uh, roughness in, on the, uh, asphalt layer before milling it off and CPET also did that after the concrete was placed. So as I was saying, this, the city does, um, coring and, uh, as part of the coring, this was a core of samples that were collected uh, along Jameson Avenue. The asphalt thickness in Jameson Avenue ranged between 75 millimeters and 85 millimeters. The concrete thickness ranged between 150 millimeters all the way up to 235 millimeters. And then the granular base varied between about 140 to uh, 340 millimeters of granular. Beneath that, the uh, subgrade was a clay uh, sometimes topsoil in some areas. Um, and 
the topsoil, I believe, was also moist in, in a lot of cases. So the core information that we have was crucial in also selecting the type of um, overlay we were going to choose. So this is some of the FWD testing and the LWD testing. Um, what came of that testing was that we confirmed that many of the transverse cracks or sorry joints were functioning below 70 percent capacity and that the pavement lacks stiffness. Uh, you could see that in some of the pre um, condition photos the, at the joint locations there was a lot of movement happening in that asphalt. Voids were also detected beneath section 2 of Jameson Avenue uh, during testing and that's key to some photos you'll see um, shortly and LWD uh, confirmed the results of the FWD and other tests. So after all that uh, non-destructive work was done other than the cores, uh, the asphalt was removed, it was cleaned, and then it was visually inspected by the team. So the visual inspection um, confirmed that there was no longitudinal joints, so it was placed basically in, in one slab. Um, in the concrete base. And longitudinal joint uh, was present in the, sorry. There was cracking of the longitudinal joint uh, that was present all the way down the entire road. Uh, there had been some previous utility road cuts that were not repaired with concrete. And unfortunately that's a historical issue that we've had. Um, and I'm sure many other municipalities have. The, um, when they would do a road cut, they would find that the concrete base was in poor condition and they found it hard to, to pour the concrete and add dowel bars in. So what they would do is they would um, instead just go with a, they would call a deep strength asphalt where they would basically put a binder asphalt in uh, up to the surface of the concrete base and then they would just pave over top. So that's something we're, we're working with contractors now to understand the importance of putting concrete back rather than asphalt when they do these repairs to these types of roads. And generally the existing concrete base appeared to be in, in poor condition. So from the testing and inspection of the works that were done, we determined what the type of uh, overlay was gonna be. And that was gonna be an unbonded concrete overlay. Because of the concrete road base, it just made sense. We didn't want to, to go with a bonded concrete overlay with the concrete road base being uh, in poor condition the way it was. Uh, this was further broken down into separate layers, which we kind of talked about previously. An asphalt layer, of se a separation layer, uh, 25 millimeters of asphalt between the existing concrete road base and the new concrete overlay, as well as the geotextile layer between the existing concrete road base and the new concrete overlay. And that goes back to the, the core information as I was explaining as well, because the core, the cores, you could see that uh, the asphalt varied from 75 to 85 millimeters and the adjacent properties um, had some bearing as to why a geotextile layer would be important to try. I'll explain that in the sections as we move forward. So section one, which was basically starting at the west fifth, so starting from the west end of the job, moving towards the east. Section one was the use of the geotextile layer. It uh, was 100 millimeters of concrete thickness, and we use a 32 MPA exposure class C2 uh, concrete. Section two, we use the uh, asphalt uh, separation layer. So that was one inch thick of asphalt. Uh, CPAT proposed an HL3. The city of Hamilton does use SP or super pave asphalt, but uh, an HL3 was specified in this case. And again, it was a 32 MPA class, exposure class C2. And then the third was, again, we use the asphalt separation layer. Uh, the, what's different between the section three and the section two was we added uh, fibers to the concrete base. Um, and I'll explain something else, another change that happened in section three in a minute when I, when I get to the next slide. But that was the overall premise of how we were gonna move forward with the, um, the uh, project. So section one, as I was just explaining, started West 5th. Section one is the um, 
concrete overlay using the geotextile. Section two was using the asphalt um, separation layer, one inch thick. And then section three was the one uh, similar to section two, but with fiber added. Now the change that happened in section three was we also decided, you can see there in section three, it says Alexanian carpets. Uh, and beside the Alexanian carpet, there is a church. And talking to the um, Alexanian carpet, we found out that they had a, quite a few shipments of carpeting that comes in and their access for the shipments were off of Jameson Avenue. So trying to mitigate the impact to the, the business as well as to the church that because this project was happening in the summer, um, the church was having camp um, bus loads of kids coming in. So we had buses coming in and out in, in traffic. Uh, we opted to go with a high early strength concrete in, in this section to enable the um, road to be open sooner uh, to allow access, especially for those carpet deliveries to the, to the store. So what had to happen first before we could do the work? So we, we had some pre-construction overlay works that needed to be done. So um, through the discussion with the contractor and, and our asset management group and, and uh, everyone involved, we decided that uh, if we replace all this concrete sidewalks or the ones that hadn't been replaced um, with new instead of doing just sections, uh, it would help with uh, using a screed. So we could set the screed rail on the sidewalk and allow the, the screed to move freely without having to set up uh, a different type of system. This also helped us though with some existing trip fall hazards and damage and it also helped us work with the driveways. Um, because we wanted to put a 100 millimeter overlay and, and the current asphalt configuration that was there was uh, up to 85 millimeters, we needed to do some playing around with the curb to ensure that we could get everything to work, the sidewalk elevations to match, the driveway elevations to match. So in this situation, we ended up opting to go with a, uh, a less height curb, we went from a six inch curb face to a four inch curb face. And that helped us work with the grades in being able to provide that 100 millimeter overlay um, with the um, asphalt. In section one, where we went with the geotextile, the difference there was the existing sidewalks had already been replaced through maintenance contract and th that curb height was set. So using the geotextile in that location was perfect because it allowed us to deal with the uh, elevation difference um, without having to rip out all that new concrete that was replaced. Uh, as well as the new sidewalks that allowed us to put in the AODA treatments, which was uh, a requirement starting in 2016. Uh, catch basin and maintenance holes had to be isolated uh, appropriately. So the Concrete Ontario and the, and the Cement Association of Canada uh, recommended that all of the structures be properly isolated um, for the concrete overlay providing, and they provided us some guidance with how to isolate them. This is a typical um, uh, layout of, of, from the American Concrete Pavement Association, how to isolate structures in the various configurations of the, uh, the uh, concrete where we were doing the saw cutting. So I didn't have any photos of the actual isolation, unfortunately, but I do have the after uh, photo. So you can see here, this is a, a single catch basin um, that is coming up. I think this is at um, Hawk Ridge. And the, uh, you can see where the formwork was in the photo there where the, I'm using my pointer here, you can see the line of the, um, form work that was left out. And the curb was also left out to be poured so that the gr uh, grades of the catch basin could be properly set. This is another location where the, a larger section was left box out because as you can see, we didn't relocate it or remove or replace any of the existing catch basins. The catch basins were cast in place. So they're really large structures. So to keep the costs down, we left them in place. In this situation, the catch basin needed to be set back a little bit. So a larger, uh, area need to be boxed out for this application. And then the maintenance hole structures um, in the middle of the road here, you can see again, it was boxed out to isolate. 
Um, I didn't have any photos of the sidewalks um, when they were getting constructed either, unfortunately. Um, this project was fast and furious once they got started. We had some really hot days that August when this work was being done. So the concrete went quite quickly and early. Um, but you can see the new concrete uh, sidewalk was was installed. The work to the side of the um, driveway was completed, the back side of the sidewalk, and a new curb was installed in this location. The gutter bricks were removed and a new curb was installed. New curb helps set the grades as well to ensure that the screeds would be accurate when they were installed, the screed rails. This is another shot of, uh, I think this is Hawk Ridge we're looking at. We're looking west towards West Fifth. Um, the Yeovil neighborhood was still being resurfaced in 2017. So we were gonna match in at uh, the side streets with asphalt. Um, that was gonna continue as an, as an asphalt uh, shave and pave project. The, uh, our AODA treatments may look different to many of the municipalities. Um, our uh, people with disabilities group uh, prefers a concrete um, AODA treatment. That's something, you know, Alan, maybe we could talk about in, in the future um, uh, presentation, why the city of Hamilton opted to go with the concrete one rather than the plastic or the steel plates. Um, we've also maintained the blind lines too, just to go on a little sidetrack here with our with our AODA treatments. The the um, sorry, not your blind lines, but directional lines. They're to help the individuals that have um, need visual aids, uh, and it's a preference in the community to continue with the blind li with the directional lines. I know that uh, they're not a requirement anymore in the AODA, but it's something that the city of Hamilton has still required. And just another shot looking now east towards uh, Upper James. Another treatment, this is now looking down uh, Hawk Ridge. So section one was the geotextile. So this is looking from West Fifth down uh, towards Upper James. Uh, the sidewalks are in place. Uh, you can see the screed rails along the edge of the sidewalk. The uh, catch basins have been boxed out and the geotextile was, was placed. The geotextile chosen was a non-woven geotextile. You can see the side in the second photo. Section two was the asphalt overlay, which was uh, one inch thick, uh, SP95, I believe they used in this situation. Um, it's just being rolled here. Again, you can see that the, the, the uh, catch basin has been boxed out and the curbs have already been uh, set. Um, as part of the CPAT work that Raha did for her master's thesis, we uh, installed strain gauges um, in various sections to pick up data uh, to see how the concrete was performing under loadings. So this is them installing them. Um, the picture to the left is uh, being installed in front of the concrete uh, as it's being placed and the gauges are in a longitudinal and transverse direction uh, and it's being laid up over top of the uh, geotextile fabric. And the picture to the right is just a, a close-up view of what the strain gauge looks like. So then construction begins. So this is again um, looking up towards West Fifth. This is the start of section one, um, looking back. They've got the Razorback uh, working there, um, which is a truss screed system, which I'll get into in a minute. Uh, the nice thing about the screed system that was used was it allowed us to provide a 2% crossfall, something that the city requires for its rows to ensure proper drainage. So the, the truss screed allowed a break in the middle to provide that 2% crossfall. So it's a great shot. You can see that that crossfall is in there. Uh, we went with a broom finish. The, the, the behind the screed was floated in some locations, and then uh, after the float, a, a broom finish was completed, um, it, to, just to give it the texture, the micro texture that I was looking for for friction capabilities on on the road. Uh, this is a short video. I've, I've turned the audio off, uh, so it's going to be quiet, but I'll explain. Oop, it didn't work. Let's see if we can try that again. There we go. 
So this is the, uh, they're just doing the broom finish now. The screed is going, they're doing a, a float just behind the screed as it's being placed. The concrete truck. So the issue we had, and I'll get into that uh, in a couple more slides, but as you can see, the, the problem with the geotextiles is the geotextiles down and the concrete trucks and the pickup trucks and all that are dropping on it, which created some difficulties. Uh, you can see the concrete truck here is, is on the, the geotextile. I'll, I'll get into more of that in, in a little bit. So um, once the concrete is placed with the razor back, we uh, cut it. And, and the, the concern was that because of the, how thin the slab was, 100 millimeters, uh, we want to ensure that we got on it as soon as we could to prevent any cracking from occurring. So the, we opted for a one and a half meter wide uh, joint, or sorry, uh, spacing for the transverse uh, um, joints. And then the longitudinal joints were cut with a one down the center line of the road and then two longitudinal joints um, on either side, or sorry, a longitudinal joint on either side of the center line cut uh, that was equidistant of the road. Jameson Avenue was eight and a half meters long, so it wasn't exactly perfectly 1.5 meter spacing, but it worked out quite well. So we did some soft cutting. So this, this equipment you're seeing here is soft cutting. It allows the, the um, cutting earlier on um, than normal using the, the normal saw cuts that are used by the contractors. Um, in the photo, if you take a look actually to more of the middle of the photo, you can see that we may have got on a little bit sooner than, than anticipated. The white cure was still uh, a little tacky there and uh, you can see some footprints in it. But uh, again, it was really hot when we placed this, this uh, concrete. Um, we had some really hot days. The sun was, was just beating down on the concrete. We had light breeze going on it. So we really want to make sure that we got the um, curing on as quickly as possible and then started cutting it as soon as we could because we wanted to make sure that we mitigated any of those cracking that had happened. This is a shot you can see uh, quite well, actually, the, the spacing of the, of the uh, joints, the longitudinal and the transverse joints. There was a lot of cutting that had to be done to, to do this project. Uh, this is just a photo of, of some of the boxing out of the isolation uh, with, the, with the joints being placed coming up to them. We tried to go to the corners in this situation. We have, we have some smaller cuts, but again, overall, the, the jointing did quite well. And uh, we don't see a lot of cracking going on specifically at this location either. Um, this is the structure box out being now, uh, the structure is being set, catch basins are, are being um, adjusted and so are the uh, maintenance holes. That was the maintenance hole earlier. So challenges. So as I was talking about earlier with the um, overlays, the uh, geotextile fabric was really tough to, to lay down. Uh, something we would probably do if we would do this again what would be to um, maybe have it more in advance or not, sorry, not out as far as in advance of the concrete placement, maybe have the, the geotextile rolled up um, in front of the concrete truck and before it's being placed. The other option could be maybe using a pump truck uh, where I could sit off the, the, the geotextile and allow the uh, concrete to be placed that way without the turning. You can see the pickup trucks how they're parked again, you know, it kind of created problems because every time they turn those wheels that they pulled on the, the geotextile. And the problem with the geotextiles, we want to make sure that they it wasn't coupled to that uh, existing concrete base. You want it to be free moving so that the two pieces of concrete, the, the surface layer and the existing uh, base layer would um, move uh, separately from each other. Again, this is just another photo, zoomed in on a photo here, but you can see all the poles in the geotextile. And there's concerns and that may have some um, issues with cracking down the road. Just zooming in there, you can see the pole along the edge. Other issue we had was, you know, 
getting quickly enough on it with the curing compound. I was explaining it was very hot the days we placed this concrete. Um, we had to get on the contractor to be um, spraying that curing compound much faster uh, behind the, the broom finish. Want to ensure that we're getting that curing completed correctly. The other issue was is they needed two people to be curing the concrete with the curing, spraying the concrete with the curing compound. Uh, in this photo here, we only had one working at the time. They had to move another person in and start doing both sides because uh, as you can see that the spray wasn't getting all the way to the opposite side of the road. Um, you know, and getting that center line was also tough. So uh, that was some another challenge with uh, ensuring good coverage of that curing compound. So what does Jameson Avenue look like? Well, this photo was in 2018. Um, so two years, almost two years after the, the, uh, the project was completed. Um, the road was, has held up very well uh, compared to the shape as you could see from the, the previous photos, the, the pre-construction photos. The, um, the, the picture to the right shows one of our, again, our standard approaches. And uh, in this case, a expansion joint was used and I'll get to the reason why I'm pointing this out later. The photo I showed earlier of all those saw cuts at the uh, maintenance hole structures, uh, again, held up quite well. There's no cracking. The cracking was mitigated because we got on them quite quickly. The one thing is though, is because we got on the concrete as quickly as we did, you're gonna see a lot of the uh, cuts or, or joints that were cut into the, the concrete, um, the aggregate popped in many of the cases. And so a lot of the, the joints look like this. I haven't seen much issues with, with that because of it though so far uh, related to the cuts that is. One concern we did have though was in that area where I believe, we, we believe it's the area, it's a low point of the road. Um, so in that sag area, as well as there's, there was a couple areas, as you saw in the core information, that there, they actually found some topsoil underneath the existing uh, concrete base. So the road is starting to fail in, in this section. And this is, again, November of 2018. And this is looking at the, uh, the structures there uh, that's looking westbound towards West Fifth. The, in this location at, in November 2018, uh, the cracking in the, in the um, damage that was occurring to the concrete um, was about four panels, so about six meters roughly in total. Uh, cracking did occur in some of the panels in, in November of 2018. Um, but again, overall though, definitely the, the cracking was mitigated compared to what we probably would be seeing with reflective cracking if we had placed asphalt right now. So this is Jameson Avenue in August of 2020. So I was just out there last week and took some updated photos. As you can see, the concrete is holding up very well, exceptional. We're quite happy with the, with the way the road is. It rides beautifully still. Um, the, uh, the, the ride is much smoother than it was when pre-construction. Um, so if you remember, I mentioned about the, uh, looking at the expansion material that was put in against that, uh, standard approach. So one thing we did see was where we didn't do that, we're seeing some spalling occurring, joint spalling has occurred where the concrete is pushing against that, that concrete curb that was installed. That's in a couple locations. This is down towards Upper James. Um, this is that area, that photo of, that I showed earlier as well, where we saw some, the concrete deteriorating and I'll, I'll explain a little bit more on this photo um, in a couple more slides. Uh, the picture on the left was, uh, I believe that was the same location of the crack that I showed in, in 2018. Uh, you can also see in the picture on the left, we've already had a road cut. Uh, we uh, I wasn't sure if it, I believe it was a water service need to be replaced um, or there was a failure in, in the uh, one of the sanitary laterals, but uh, the road was cut and uh, that they actually did a concrete repair in this case. And on the photo on the right, again, it's just another uh, longitudinal crack that was occurring. Uh, again, the purpose of whether it was a reflective crack or, or what the cause is, we're still unsure, but we're gonna start looking into that. 
pavement markings talked about earlier about how pavement markings lo look on the on the concrete um in this case we use thermoplastic in in the uh in the pavement markings you can see where the plows have basically chipped it off um but ultimately it's it's held up quite well and it uh does look pretty good if you look at the top left uh, corner of the screen up in here that's the um Caledon that was resurfaced with asphalt and as you can see there's already been some cracking reflecting through much more severely than we've seen in the concrete back to this area of, of deterioration so back in 2018 uh, this is how where the concrete was was um, in poor shape and then this is what it's starting to look like now in, in August of 2020 so there's definitely failure going on and, and the city would is um, we were going to uh, talk to uh, the CPAT team and um, Concrete Ontario about how to address repairing this and investigating the work. Unfortunately, COVID then hit, so that kind of got a little side railed. Um, but we are looking at doing a proper uh, investigation into what's going on and and figuring out how to do a proper repair. You can see that the concrete is deteriorating pretty badly. Um, we don't know if, again, if it's the underlying soil material that's causing this, or if it's the um, possibly moisture, or it could be a number of things. So again, a proper investigation needs to be looked at. So a life cycle analysis was done as part of Raha's um, master's uh, thesis. And what we were able to determine was, had we gone with the normal shave and pave, or mill and replace, or mill and fill, whatever you want to call it, um, the, the life cycle analysis cost says this road would have been about $525,000. Compare that to what we did when we looked at the concrete overlay. So the concrete overlay, an unbonded overlay in our situation, comes in at $412,000. So again, these are forecasted numbers, but already you're seeing a savings of 21, uh, almost 22%. So, so this was ex exceptional for the city and something that we would like to start looking into more. We wanna find out what those issues are that are occurring um, in, in the locations. You know, is the cracking due to reflective cracking or is the cracking due to uh, maybe a fold in the uh, geotextile fabric? We're not sure, but um, a 22% savings uh, on this roadway from a life cycle cost analysis uh, is pretty impressive and, and that's money that the city can take and use on other projects that need to be done other resurfacings or or uh, areas in, in need that normally may not have the budget or is waiting for a budget to become available so i've got about 10 more minutes and i'm just going to kind of go into uh, a few more projects that uh, the city has done um in 2019 the city did quite a few uh concrete road projects and i call it the year of the exposed concrete road um we had uh three large projects all in our uh north area of the road of the uh, city uh parkdale north steel city court uh that's right in our industrial area if anybody knows hamilton it's it's north of burlington street um it's surrounded by industry uh the truck traffic in that area is, is practically 90% um, just because of the industry that's there. That project was a, a $5 million project that we did in 2019. Uh, Birch Avenue, which is from Wilson Street to Princess, um, the first phase of a, of a much larger project uh, was an exposed concrete road. That project came in at $3 million. And then Brampton Street, which is from Strathern to Parkdale. Again, uh, uh, Brampton Street is an east-west road that, that runs adjacent to a lot of industry. Uh, heavy truck traffic was uh, reconstructed uh, and that was a $2.5 million project. In 2021, we have a, a large project, Composite Road, that's coming up. It may even move into a, a exposed concrete road. We're unsure. We're currently in the design phase right now and doing the geotechnical information on it. That's Barton Street, Parkdale to Talbot. So if anybody again knows Hamilton, um, there's a concrete plant that's uh, that comes in off this road. There's a, a Peterbilt uh, truck 
um, service center as well as a sales center that's there. Lowe's is located in this area, Princess Auto. So a lot of truck traffic that comes up and down as well as vehicular traffic. I'm gonna talk about uh, the three uh, projects quite quickly um, so we can uh, still hit our timeline. The first one's Parkdale North. So Parkdale is that north-south photo there or uh, street there that's, that's running uh, to the left of the photo. Uh, and Steel City Court is an east-west road that uh, runs parallel to the Nikola Tesla Boulevard. Uh, there's the Hamilton Petro Pass, so that's a, a trucking gas station. Um, my understanding is it's one of the only ones located between uh, the border and Toronto. So it's heavily used. It's a 24-7 operation. Beside that is, is a recycling, a metal recycling facility to the right of it. To the north, you can kind of see it off in the distance. There's another metal recycling facility. There's a rendering plant beside that. You've got a chemical uh, coatings plant that's uh, to the west of Parkdale North, as well as a, a, one of our force main pump stations. So it's a lot of industry in this area. This is what Parkdale North looked like. Uh, it was a composite road, and this is what it looked like prior to us getting out there. It was, it was literally falling apart. We had lots of complaints from the adjacent properties to the condition of the road. That first photo was looking north and this photo is from the railway tracks on the, the north end of the project looking south towards Burlington Street. A lot of industry there and a lot of uh, um, truck traffic. The water is from to try and keep the dust down from the, from the uh, steel recyclers. The contractor that got the job um, got a drone. I wish I could upload the drone footage, it's pretty cool, but it's quite large in size and, and didn't work well with the presentation. You can see here, this is looking north towards Lake Ontario. The concrete road is, is installed to the west side of the road that you can see the white portion of the concrete road here. To facilitate all the truck traffic in the area, we had to build a access road uh, to allow the trucks to gain entrance to the um, gas station on the uh, east side of the road and to the metal facility in the back and the rendering plant to the north. So that there was some additional cost to this to just to allow the truck traffic to be maintained. This is the same uh, drone footage now looking north, uh, or sorry, south towards Burlington Street. And another photo of that truck traffic coming in off that uh, uh, temporary road that we built. And just to the bottom of the photo, you can see that the uh, concrete road uh, south of the railway tracks uh, was just being formed up. This is Steel City Court. Uh, again, this section, because we had to maintain truck traffic and we didn't have the option of building a, a temporary road in this location because of uh, Trans Northern Pipeline having a, a pipeline underneath, uh, we, had to make, we had to do it in stages. So we, we built the... Um, uh, south side first and then built the north side afterwards and these are cars coming in. Uh, in this project it was all done, it wasn't done with a razor back, it was done with a form work being set up and a, uh, a screed that was pulled behind. This was a, a ro screed roller that was pulled behind by hand. Two people were used to pull it. It was um, hydraulic so they had a generator and then hydraulics coming out of that to, to pump and, and turn the screed. Yeah, the screed goes in the opposite direction in which it was being pulled. Uh, you can see the guys at the rigs afterwards and then it was floated after that and with a broom finish again. Um, this just shows the uh, finish to the, the broom finish with the dowel bars that are sticking out. I'm running out of time so I'm going to start going through it quickly. Uh, and then this is the north portion with the uh, white cure that's been placed on top. And again you can see the trucks that are they're non-stop in, in this area. Um, this is Birch Avenue. Uh, Birch Avenue is a very long street. Princess is all the way at the top here. And then Wilson Street, which is the uh, south limit of the construction is at the bottom. Um, this project was one of our uh, arterial roads that uh, facilitated a lot of the traffic during the steel industry. When we had you know 3000 people coming out of the steel industry at shift change. So this road was a one way street that is gonna be converted to two way. Um, at the top north end, not shown in this photo, there's a new bus barn going in and a maintenance facility for our HSR bus service. So the estimate that was uh, proposed is about 400 buses 
loaded and, and empty a day on this road. So the option to go with a composite road, we felt wasn't good. We, we felt we should go with an exposed concrete road. This is what it looked like before. Again, you can see some of the, the uh, transverse joints, uh, some failures that were going on. Um, this is uh, another look on from Barton Street looking north. This is a, an issue we had. Uh, Hydro One transmission towers were in the area, so we had to work around them, even though they were on city property. But you can see in the photo that the footings were not the greatest of shape. So, you know, going with a full depth road reconstruction was going to be difficult in this area. Uh, we did have to put a water main in, but we were able to maneuver that away from the footings. But building the road to suit the, the soil conditions for this project would have been tough. So a concrete, exposed concrete road was, was a good option here. As I was saying about the, the soil conditions, in this situation, we went with an exposed concrete road for, to help with the structure and, and the loadings that we had, but also we all, to ensure that we didn't have any failure because we can have so many buses on it, we ended up going also with the geogrid system underneath the granular for the concrete um, road. Uh, this is just to provide extra security because we were concerned about the, the loadings that were gonna occur. Uh, this is just a shot of the load transfer devices that were being placed in the concrete. Uh, they use a different screed. They use two screeds here. They have a mechanical screed, more of a float type screed in this case. They have a bull float uh, by hand also with a broom finish. And then they also use the roller screed as you saw in the Parkdale project. We did have challenges on this project. The contractor was delayed some time. Uh, and, you know, everyone's fears, we end up having to place concrete in the winter. And this is just one of the shots of, of that happening. You can see the load transfer devices are out. But I can rest assured we did put blankets down and we did not have any issues with any uh, freezing of any of the concretes on this project. Finally, and last but not least, Brampton Street, which is in the industrial area. I don't have a lot of slides on this one. Um, Brampton Street is fully industrial. It mostly, again, truck traffic going to and fro. You get to Fasco in the bottom left-hand corner. Um, you've got a hydro facility at the top right, CP crossing. You've got uh, a metal recycling facility, other industry all adjacent to the properties. So heavy, heavy truck traffic in this, in this situation. Um, this photo is just again of the existing conditions prior to construction. You can see we, even where we had some concrete uh, areas where there was a heavy usage for repair, um, it, was, it was just falling apart because of the amount of truck traffic that was on it. So we ended up going with the exposed concrete road. Unfortunately, I didn't have any photos from uh, construction prior to this presentation, but I can rest assured that the project was under construction and it has since been completed. So if you have any questions, um, I'd be happy to help. This, this photo actually is from Hamilton. Uh, this gentleman on the motorcycle decided it'd be fun to weave in and out of the construction barrels and ended up getting himself into a sticky situation. So I just wanted to conclude that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Uh, that was a very thorough overview. Um, we are out of time a little bit, but we'll take you know one or two questions just to make sure we, we summarize everything. Uh, I guess the first question is, um, you know, you, you've slowly moved away from the composite pavements, but you've moved towards exposed pavements. What would you tell other municipalities who are very hesitant in actually trying an exposed concrete pavement? Um, I, I think it comes down to ensuring you do your your homework first on the road. Um, for instance, both the well, all the Parkdale, Birch, and, and Brampton streets, we did look at um, composite roads. The one thing that we do see though is is because you have the two dissimilar materials, um, the asphalts uh, and, and the concrete, and they're supposed to be reacting as one uh, pavement. You know, if you if you don't have a good adhesion between the, the concrete and the asphalt, you see we're seeing failure in in that asphalt overlay, and and we're seeing uh, premature cracking occurring, uh, rutting, a number of things. And in in the situation, you know, when you look at the amount of base repairs that we would have had to do on Brampton Street, for instance, um, and Parkdale. Uh, and then the asphalt overlay on top of the concrete, it just didn't seem feasible. So from a cost savings point of view, going with the exposed concrete road ended up being cheaper in the long run than, than going with the, with the um, composite. Great. Um, there's obviously, you know, challenges when it comes to concrete as you've outlined, but, you know, 22% uh, savings 
on that project on Jameson Avenue is, is quite huge. Um, but we, which section would you say uh, performed the best uh, out of the three different uh, for the pilot project? Um, probably the third section, the section down towards uh, Upper James, which is the east portion of the road. Now, whether or not that has to do with the fibers uh, and the high, uh, early strength concrete that was placed, I'm not sure. Um, when I walked the site uh, back in November uh, in 2018, and then most recently um, uh, a week ago, you know, it, it seemed to be the one that had the least amount of cracking, as well as uh, issues with the concrete. Now, again, that that was on a higher side of the roadway. Um, the uh, it does have a lot more traffic loading with respect to the trucks turning on it, but it, it definitely performed well. Uh, that being said, though, the the area uh, off of West Fifth, uh, Section One, um, performed I would say well as uh, also, um, but it doesn't have the same type of loadings on it. It's more vehicular loadings that go up and down that section there. Um, so it's it's hard to say. I think we we need to take a, a cl much closer look, maybe and, and go through them. But I would definitely say, for my walk last week, uh, section three has held up the best. Okay, perfect. Uh, and I guess just last question because we are almost out of time. Um, now I was walking the site when it was actually being built on Jameson Avenue, and some of the residents were saying, "When are we getting the the white road as part of our <laughs> neighborhood?" Um, have you heard any other additional feedback from residents since it's uh, been built? Um, no, actually, I haven't heard anything from from the residents um, in, like that live on Jameson. They all seem quite happy. Even when, like as you said, when we were when we were constructing it, I, I know that we got a lot of positive feedback. Even though they were displaced from accessing their driveways, uh, the feedback was was very positive and. Um, they, they they like the the uh, the quality of the road that was placed, um, but otherwise from the other surrounding uh, neighbors in the neighborhood, no, we haven't had much feedback on it, uh, which is a good thing because uh, normally we get negative comments and and, and get, not getting any comments at all or or small uh, positive ones is great. So again, overall, I think the city's quite happy with the way Jameson turned out and how it's performing and i think that um you know once we determine what's going on in that one section that we've identified uh i think it's a good option and it's something that we have talked about um for other locations in the city um as as they come up for for resurfacing that's, that's great to hear um again thank you very much for your your presentation it was uh definitely a great overview of how concrete can be used successfully and uh we wish you guys all the best of luck in finding additional roads that you can resurface and hopefully get again the 22 percent savings so again thank you very much mike great thank you um now in terms thanks, of mike. Oh, thanks tim now in terms of what do we have next uh in september we are looking at more um case studies so we're going to be looking at a different application the 7-3 fire station slash ems station 31 in uh, vaughn it just won the first annual Ontario Good Roads Association Municipal Concrete Award back in February. So it's very exciting. I know Tim was involved with this when he was with Englobe. He uh, put together part of the design. So we'll have uh, Tim provide uh, a little bit of for that, for that presentation, but we will lock, be locking this in in the next uh, few weeks and, and that will go out to all the participants today. And this is just what it looks like before and after. You can really see the deter deterioration. Um, it had to be, patched uh, a few times before the city uh, finally decided to to give concrete a chance and moving forward uh, they are only considering concrete for fire stations which is definitely very very positive so again thank you very much everybody for tuning in i know there's more questions uh, so feel free to reach out to myself tim or uh, mike directly and we'll be sure to answer your questions and thank you again and uh, hopefully everybody participates in september for another great case study so thank you and have a great day